guy answers. <laughs> Welcome to the June meeting. Uh, some of you may still think that there's going to be a certain speaker here who's not going to be here tonight. Uh, I, I should explain that uh, Catlin is doing okay. Uh, Catlin is an IBM employee in the Sacramento area who is allergic to bees. And she walked out of her house yesterday and got stung and immediately knew she had a problem and was driving pell-mell to the bank, uh, to the uh, hospital. She only got a block and a half before she knew she had to stop. She pulled over, ran up to the house, and collapsed on the porch. So it was really serious, and she was in the hospital from then until about 7 o'clock this morning. But uh, when I talked to her at noon today, she was coming out of it and uh, would be out of it, but probably wasn't in shape to drive from Sacramento down to the Bay Area. So, uh, so we said we'll have to give her a buy on this uh, this time. It's too bad because it was a very interesting presentation. But this is the most fantastic group you could possibly imagine. What other group would have the creator of 386 BSD contact you when he gets the email saying there's not going to be a speaker this evening and say, "Oh, I can come," <laughs> and uh, and we're very very pleased uh, for that. Um, before getting to it, I, we're going to videotape tonight's meeting. I don't know if any of you had a chance to look at them, but people are reviewing the videotapes. Uh, we keep the archives of all the presentations, and we are now up to 35,000 archive reviews, so there's a considerable amount of uh, going back and reviewing what people said. I don't know, today's litigious uh, environment, maybe we're going to think about it a little bit, because it goes to, what did I say, in 1999, 2000? <laughs> 2001, see if I want to be still on record for that. <laughs> Our speaker tonight, by any means, by any measure, is a real Unix maven. Uh, Bill used to be responsible for uh, BSD on the PDP-11, for those of you that go back to many computers. Uh, and he went from that into doing the 386, and that 386 BSD is the foundation of every every Unix system I've ever seen run on, a, on an Intel platform. So he's really the father of, in some respect, in, in some respects, the lineage of BSD and uh, Linux and all of the, the other open source packages that are Unix-like running on uh, running on uh, Intel platforms. He's the founder of two different companies. Uh, most impressive was when he graduated from uh, Berkeley, they didn't tell him that it was a tough job, but the first thing he did was go out and found a company that actually ran for many years, in the early 80s until the late 80s, uh, called uh, Symmetric. He's been a consultant to more companies than you can count, Sun Microsystems, Honeywell Bull, uh, Hewlett Packard, Los Alamos, uh, lots of lots of different things. He's been a true Unix insider for a long time, man. Is he said in the email going on here, has published 30 some articles in Dr. Dobbs and, and in uh, Unix magazine, and, and he's a recognized authority. He also has a lot of interest in open source, particularly in the current climate of open source, uh, in the SCO climate of open source, let's say, and, and what's going on with, with uh, in property rights and what should go on in property rights. And so that's the area in which he would like to uh, spend most of his time this evening. Bill? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Open source is going to revolutionize the next hundred years of technology development. We're sad in the valley right now because there's a lot of people who can't do as much as they were doing a little while earlier. Rest. Easy. This is just a lull in the action. We're all going to be going back, and it's going to be going at an even more frenetic rate because a lot of things are changing. But as the more things change, remember, some parts stay the same. So I want to draw your attention to life in the real world. Real world, by the way, means real issues. Now there's some nice real issues, like uh, 
one of the authors of 386BSD got a nice award from Oracle uh, for work uh, on uh, this. Those, those are really nice real world issues. You like to be rewarded for the things that you do. But you also got to deal with the obstacles. Now, you guys probably have spent a little time on working with open source. You may have it in part of your data center. You may have it in part of your home. You may have it even on your PDA. Uh, open source, I wouldn't be surprised if you'll find watches with open source in it in probably a matter of a couple of, of years. It will be the thing that allows a lot of developers uh, the wiggle room to unify a lot of these disparate technologies that we have. That's the only way that sensible technologists can actually really bring this thing together for the consumer, for the masses, for the businessman. So I'm going to talk to you about the obstacles. I'm going to talk to you also about another issue. And that is, <coughs> another issue of the real world is, how in the world do we get from A to B? Somebody's got to drive, a, uh, uh, somebody's got to set a, a, an agenda, somebody's got to say we're going to go all over here. That's an issue when you get into uh, open source that you don't have in a closed source way. There's some, uh, guy who's a big boss, whether uh, he has glasses and uh, several billion dollars uh, or something else, uh, you have a defined de facto control. Well, that's not the case with open source. That's one of its great advantages. And it's also one of its difficulties. And right now, uh, there are a lot of people who are challenged by the control of open source. And so they sometimes react rather negatively. Uh, like you may have seen in the press. Uh, perhaps a little over the top. Uh, and you may have noticed that in recent years, we hear about WorldCom and Napster and all sorts of things. <coughs> it really seems to be a very exciting world in which we live in. You never know what you, when you pick up the newspaper the next day quite what you're going to see. So control is important. Clarity, however, is also another thing. For a developer, there's nothing more important than clarity. Where do I go next? Why do I go there? Why not this other thing? Do I work on the past or do I work on the future? And from my perspective, if a developer doesn't have clarity, he doesn't know what to do. And he isn't as effective. Well, open source provides you with avenues to get clarity, but it also can confuse you uh, at times. And you don't want, need the con confusion. So we're going to have to start that out. And one of the things that has been sadly lacking in recent years has been this idea of history. I think that was one of the things that really dismayed me at one point when we at Berkeley went through the effort of proving where we got our ideas from, where we got our code from, wrote them up in papers. We had the numbers to justify the performance, the comparison with other algorithms. That's about the time that I started to spend more time on business and less time uh, uh, actively pushing bits through a compiler, was that I began to realize that if history wasn't valued, sooner or later, there would come this day in which I'd be up here in front of all of you talking about why history matters and what, where it plays a role in the real world part of open source. <laughs> Recognize this guy? Okay, I got somebody in the crowd who does. This is Richard Stallman. Uh, now, the, a lot of these pictures don't have anything to do with the, the text. No, circa, uh, circa when? Because I don't, didn't recognize him. I know Richard. Oh, this is this is a fairly recent picture. I got it from the oh last. <laughs> Mission. That's really what you see here with him pointing. Okay. Okay. An obstacle for open source is not clearly as elucidating the mission and having everybody bought into why are we doing this? Now, maybe you think that the mission is being anti-Microsoft or something like that. I don't know. That's one definition of a mission. Okay? There can be, uh, Richard's mission is that software be free. And he has a very decided view of what that means. 
He doesn't, he's, he's not even super keen on things like open software because he, it misses the mission. Uh, I remember getting introduced to Richard uh, quite a while ago. Uh, he stayed one night at uh, my house uh, in Berkeley. And he had a, a, a wonderful view of the possible. And at the time, there was no software in the Free Software Foundation. And you, you could tell that, th that there was a kind of a pulse, uh, uh, a throbbing. You could see a future coming here. And he, he, I learned from him some of his experiences that I'd heard before when I was briefly uh, uh, visiting with the MIT people. My email account originally, by the way, my first email account was uh, at uh, MIT, and it was uh, my email address was wfj at MIT AI hyphen AI before they had the domain names. And if you want to, you can go and search the archives and uh, uh, see uh, some of perhaps not the most brilliant comments in the world about it. But it was kind of an exciting time uh, to be there. And I did recall the problems between LMI and symbolics, and that's where I think. I would date a lot of this is coming from. So mission, clear mission. Um, if you don't have that in place, you've got an obstacle. And I think one of the issues, by the way, uh, uh, that we're going to see faced relatively soon is that open source development and free software are going to have to be more clear about what their mission is. So we don't have what uh, at the military calls mission creep and what NASA uh, uh, calls uh, uh, unplanned contingencies. And we're going to have an unplanned contingency <laughs> right now. I don't think anybody's really enjoying it very much. But that's why you have a clear mission. All these areas we're going to go through and I'm going to be able to connect you with the past, the present, and the future here. Politics, okay? If you have a clear mission, if your politics are built around uh, uh, the mission, that's great. You got, you're, you're energized. But, you know, you gotta make sure everybody in your group agrees. Because if somebody doesn't agree, then they form another splinter. And that splinter then can make life difficult for the goals of the original mission. So I'm not saying that these things are bad. I'm just saying, be aware, these are where, where this, all of the problems that are going on right now, they're rooted here. Liabilities. Any business, including a business that works off of development of uh, a open project, whether it's a free software project or simply a group of developers that are sharing their source and hope to do something else with it, 